This video is our introduction to magnetic fields. Magnetism has a lot in common with electrostatics. Uh, first of all, it's an action at a distance force. No contact is required between the object and the agent. Second, that force can be either attractive or repulsive. And the reason is similar to that of electrostatics because there are two kinds of magnetic property, just as there are positive and negative charges. They're called instead poles, and they're referred to as north and south. There's a geographic tie-in here because naturally occurring magnets, one end will always point to the north if allowed to pivot freely, and one end, of course, always points south. And so the poles are co called north and south. There are some major differences between electric field and magnetic fields, one of which is that the two kinds of polarity are never found separate from each other. There is no such thing as an isolated north magnetic pole or an isolated south magnetic pole. None has ever been discovered despite extensive searches looking for them. These hypothetical individual poles are called monopoles, and what that means is that magnetic fields are always dipolar. Because there are no isolated monopoles for field lines to start and stop on, they cannot. Magnetic field lines are always closed continuous loops. Ferromagnetism or natural magnetism has been known since ancient times. The name actually comes from a region in Greece called Magnesia, where these iron oxide minerals that are naturally magnetic were found. The Chinese were using magnetic compasses for navigation as early as 1100 AD, and in the 1500s, an English scientist named Gilbert used a compass to map out and show that the Earth itself was a magnet. The second kind of magnetism, or electromagnetism, wasn't discovered until 1820 by a Danish scientist named Ørsted. He was one day in class teaching and doing a demonstration of circuits. He built himself a circuit with some batteries and wires and things, and while setting it up, he accidentally left a compass underneath one of the wires. And he noticed that when he closed the switch and current began to flow, the compass needle would deflect. It would change away from north. He mapped around and was able to show that when placed below the wire, the compass would deflect one way. When placed above the wire, it would deflect in the opposite way. And so that told him that the force created by the current was a concentric circle around the wire. We typically think of this through a right hand rule as shown in the diagram on this slide. Your thumb goes in the direction of the conventional current and the fingers of your right hand show the way that the magnetic field lines circulate. This is one of many right hand rules associated with magnetism and you need to can keep them separate as we go through this. The reason we use conventional current is when 1820, when this was being worked out, no one knew about electrons. Following up on Ersted's discovery, two French scientists named Bio and Savard came up with an analog to Coulomb's law that describes electromagnetic fields. The equation is shown there in the top right part of the slide. What this equation does is it calculates the contribution to the net field at a location in space created by a very short segment of a current carrying wire. We make S the variable along the wire and DS is that short segment. We make it a vector by giving it the same direction as the conventional current. Remember we think about currents having uh, directions, but we never assign them a vector. The vector nature of current is handled by the current density. So you can see that this is a 1 over r squared force law like Coulomb's law. However, the cross product means that it is not a radial field. 
is this will be a circumferential field matching up with Ersted's discovery. To come up with the total field, you have to integrate over the length of the wire and sum it up. As in Coulomb's law, there's a proportionality constant. This one's called mu naught, or the magnetic constant. And an older name for it you'll still see in the literature is the magnetic permeability of free space. It has the value given there, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per amp squared. This means that the units of magnetic field will be newtons per amp meter, and that is um, abbreviated as a Tesla. Now, of course, this integral will be difficult to do unless there's some symmetry. Particularly, what we need is for all of the dBs to point in the same direction at the point in space so that adding them up becomes a scalar addition rather than a vector addition. Here's a case where that works out. We've got a long straight wire shown in gray running across the bottom of the slide. There is my current element, ds. The vector to the lo observation location is denoted as r. The radial distance from the observation location to the wire is denoted as d. And the current x-coordinate of the current segment is given by x. Now if I want to do the cross product between ds, which in this picture is horizontal, and r hat, which follows along the r vector shown there, I need the sine of that angle, and that's going to be d over r. So here that's all put into the integral. You see the constants along with i, and then the center term inside the integrand is the sine of theta times dx, and then the third term is 1 over r squared. Moving all of the things that are not functions of x outside of the integration, you see the integral that we need to do. We're doing this for a very long straight wire, which is why the, the limits of integration are from minus infinity to infinity. Now that's not a trivial integral to do. We can't do it by use substitution. We can do it by trig substitution, or as more common outside of Calculus 2 class, we just look it up in a table of integrals. When we do that and evaluate it, it simplifies to that nice, neat expression shown at the bottom. The field is proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the distance away from the wire. Another situation where the geometry works out for us is if we do a circular current loop and we set our observation point to be a distance z above the center of the loop. So this is very much like one of the Coulomb's Law problems that we integrated at the beginning of the semester. The current loop is in the xy plane and our observation point is at the coordinate 0, 0, z. We can go through and do a similar setup and we end up with the result shown at the top of the slide. So we have a more complicated behavior, behaves somewhat like z cubed, and the field will all be axial. Another right hand rule for finding the direction of the field of a circular loop of current is to let the fingers of your right hand go the way that the conventional current goes around a circle and then your thumb points the direction of this B field. So this would be right up the Z axis. This result looks similar to that for a electric dipole. We got the same Z squared plus R squared to the 3 halves power behavior that we had before. We can emphasize that similarity by defining something known as the magnetic dipole moment. And your book abbreviates magnetic dipole moments with mu, but that is not very common. They're more often denoted with a lowercase m. So the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop is the product of the area of the loop and the current flowing in the uh, loop. 
and its direction is given by the same right-hand rule as for the field above. When we make that simplification and then look in the limit where z is much bigger than the radius of the loop, this simplifies down to almost exactly the same expression we had for the electric field of a dipole. So current loops have exactly the same symmetry and dependence and distance as an electric dipole. We did this for the nice simple case of a circular loop, but with more advanced mathematics, we can actually show that this is true regardless of the shape of the current loop. All magnetic fields are dipoles. That's true even for permanent magnets, and that expression works well for the field of a permanent magnet as long as we're farther away from the magnet than the magnet is long. So there's a Coulomb's law analog for magnetic fields, the law of B, O, N sub R. Is there a Gauss's law analog for magnetic fields? Gauss's law involves taking the flux of the field over a closed surface. So what would happen if we integrate the magnetic flux over a completely closed surface? The, one of the analogies we used when talking about Gauss's law is that it counts the number of field lines entering and exiting through the closed surface. Field lines that exited through the surface made a positive contribution to the flux, and ones that entered the surface made a negative contribution to the flux. But because there is apparently no such thing as a magnetic monopole, Magnetic field lines can never start or end. They always form complete closed loops. So that means that every field line that exits the surface and makes a positive flux is at some other point going to re-enter the surface and make a negative flux. So no matter how you integrate it, what's inside the surface, what's outside the surface, it will always give you an answer of zero. Now this is an important fact, but it's not useful for helping us calculate magnetic fields like Gauss's law is for calculating electric fields. And remember that we can also apply the divergence theorem to this integral to convert that surface integral into a divergence. For any vector field, the surface integral over a closed surface is equivalent to the volume integral of the divergence of that field. Since this in case happens to be zero, what this means is that the divergence of a magnetic field is always zero. We can get more help in calculating magnetic fields instead by looking at a line integral. And looking at line integrals for magnetic fields is what's known as Ampere's law. So in this case, we're not integrating over a closed surface. We're integrating one lap around a closed curve. Any kind of shape curve will work as long as it doesn't have ends and closes back on itself. We use the same special integration symbol for this kind as we did for closed surface flux integrals. So I'm integrating along the perimeter of a open surface. Now I already know how to calculate one particular value of the field and that is for a long straight wire. I know my field has circular symmetry so I'm going to integrate along a curve S which is a circle. The magnetic field will be tangential to that circle and therefore parallel to the ds vector at every point. B will also be constant everywhere on that circle because circles have a one value of D. That's their geometric definition. So when I do the integration, I get that the, the result is simply the magnitude of B times the circumference. By comparing that to the result for this field that I got from B of R, 
what this tells us is that the line integral of the field over a closed path has to equal the magnetic constant times the total current passing through the surface bounded by this loop. Just as in Gauss's law, we don't count charges outside the surface. Here, we don't count currents and wires that are not passing through the surface bounded by our perimeter. Now again, in order for this to work in this form, we need a lot of symmetry. And there are really only two useful cases beside the long straight wire that it works for. One is the solenoid. The solenoid is you take a cylindrical form, doesn't necessarily have to be circular, and you wrap a helix of wire around the perimeter and run the current through it. One loop at the center has a nice axial field. If I stack up a bunch of loops on top of each other to make a solenoid, what this means is that the field becomes axial and uniform. So the perimeter or loop that I want to integrate around is, is shown by the red dotted rectangle. So I'm going to integrate one lap around that rectangle. Now if my solenoid is infinitely long, the field outside must be zero. The lines can't ever escape. In a real solenoid, the field outside is just fairly weak. When I integrate along inside, so in this case I'm integrating from right to left along the section of rectangle that is inside the solenoid, I'll just get B times L, where L is the length of the rectangle. On the two vertical segments, I'll get zero because DS is pointing up or down, but B is pointing horizontal dot product between two things that's perpendicular is zero. The horizontal segment outside as I integrate from left to right gives me zero because there the field is zero. So the whole closed path integral just gives me B times L. The current that's passing through that rectangle would be the total number of loops enclosed by the rectangle and multiplied by i. But since my solenoid is infinitely long, its length L is very long, is, is infinite, the total number of loops is infinite, but their ratio is finite. So we typically express the field of a solenoid in terms of the uh, number of loops per unit length. That's little n. Some older texts will often refer to that as the pitch. So we field inside a solenoid is nearly uniform as long as we're near the center. And we can find it by the number of loops per unit length times the current flowing in each loop and of course our magnetic field constant. Solenoids are very useful in research because they have this bubble inside them where the field is nearly uniform. MRI scanners are basically solenoids where the patient is placed inside the solenoid far enough in towards the center of it so that the field is quite uniform. Another really useful geometry for a magnetic field is called a toroid. Imagine taking a finite length solenoid and then wrapping it around so that the ends close in on each other. So really what you're doing is taking a donut shaped form and you're wrapping wire helically around the perimeter of that donut. In geometry that's called a toroid. Any loop that's drawn inside the solenoid or outside the solenoid has a total current of zero passing through it. The outside loop has a total current of zero because some of the currents are half as half of the currents are poking up through the plane and half of the currents are poking down through the plane so the total current would be zero. So our ampere loop is a circle. Its circumference is the total length of our perimeter 
it's parallel to b everywhere so the dot product is trivial and our loop integral is just b times 2 pi r here we have a finite number of turns capital n and so we get this relationship now the field inside is not uniform you can see it depends on the radial distance but the, the greatest thing about a toroid and why they're so useful is that property that the field outside of the torus itself is zero. This will become really useful when we talk about induction in a couple of lessons.